a second time. Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier and I'm here at the range looking at some very rare First World War British sniping equipment. So this short magazine Lee Enfield here has been fitted with a set of Ulster, also known as Neil or Barnett, optical sights or Galilean sights. And these are a type of optic where the lenses are not protected inside a tube, but rather are mounted at the front and the rear of the rifle. Now, these were adopted by the British Empire forces in September 1915 in response to a serious crisis. Now, while marksmanship was an integral part of British Army doctrine, the Germans were the first to start a formal sniper program. And they had two main advantages in this field. First, they were able to pull from a large pool of trained marksmen, including foresters, members of the Jaeger units, as well as competitors in the shoots and shooting discipline. Also, they had a very well-developed optics industry, meaning they were able to field large numbers of scoped rifles. And this program proved absolutely devastating. In the winter of 1914-1915, the average British battalion was losing something like 12 to 18 men every single day due to German snipers. And so this very quickly convinced the British to start their own sniping program. And just like the Germans, they were able to pull from a large pool of experienced marksmen, uh, competitors at the Bisley matches, gamekeepers, Scottish ghillies, and big game hunters from Africa. And indeed, early in the war, they actually sent big boar hunting rifles used to down elephants and Cape Buffalo and the like to the front in order to try and take out the metal loophole plates that the German snipers were using. Now, unfortunately, the British didn't have as much of a developed optics industry as the Germans, and so they were very slow to come up with the large numbers of properly scoped rifles that they needed. So, as a stopgap measure, they adopted Galilean sights, which had been developed for use in competitive shooting. And there were five different models that were officially used. Three of them were actually adopted, two of them were approved for private purchase. One of the oldest designs was the Martin Sight, which was invented by Alexander Martin of Paisley, Scotland in 1837. This mounted on the nose cap of the SMLE, right behind the front sight blade with its protective wings, and its reticle was a four minute of arc dot, and it used an ocular sight that mounted to the standard BSA number no. nine micrometer sight. And if you want to learn more about that one, go over to Forgotten Weapons. Ian has a video on that particular site. And about 575 of those were officially purchased. The second type was called the Laddie Sight. This is invented by one Captain Laddie of the Musketry School at Bisley. This was very similar to the Martin Sight, only it mounted in front of the front iron sights. And so you actually used your front side blade to aim. It didn't have its own reticle. However, its ocular sight was mounted to the blade of the rear tangent sight. And this was the most popular of all of the Galilean sights used. 7,000 of those were purchased. And then the third type of officially purchased Galilean sight was this one, the Ulster sight, which was invented by one T. Caldwell of Belfast in 1915. It's also known as the Neil or the Barnett sight because there is some controversy over who is actually responsible for the design. And this one's a little bit different, as you'll see, because it's actually mounted off to the left of the bore axis. And this means that you can actually use your iron sights as well as your optical sights, depending on your preference. It also has a bit of an odd mounting system. All the others were able to mount to the rifle without modifying it, whereas this one actually requires you to drill a hole under the barrel through the wooden stock in order to pass the mounting screw. This also has a four minute of arc dot on it as a reticle, and it has a proprietary aperture sight at the rear, and this mounts onto the dumbbell spring for the safety on the SMLE. And the later versions had four apertures that you could switch between, one for 200, 400, 500, and 600 yards. And about 4,000 of the Ulster sites were officially ordered. And finally, we have the two private purchase models. There was the Gibbs site, which cost around one pound private purchase, and that had an objective very similar to the Martin site, only it had a much better reticle, a post and crosshair, that was considered to be the best reticle of them all, plus its own proprietary ocular site, which was similar but not identical to the BSA number no. 9 micrometer site. 
And finally, there was the BSA sight, which had a tubular objective with three dots in a vertical pattern, and it used the regular number 9 micrometer sight. The idea being is that the aperture was small enough to act as essentially a pinhole lens to correct the image. Now, like any weapon system, these had their advantages and their disadvantages. The main advantage, the reason these were adopted in the first place, was that they were easy to, and quick to manufacture in large numbers. Uh, they were also a lot lighter than a telescopic sight, meaning they were less likely to be jostled loose by recoil, and they were more easier to mount more securely to the rifle in most cases. And then finally, if you were shooting through an armored loophole, it was much easier to fit these sights, except for the Ulster, through the hole in the plate. But they also came with a bunch of disadvantages. Uh, they were very vulnerable to collecting dirt or being damaged. The field of view was very narrow. The magnification wasn't great, somewhere between two and three times, although the regular scopes of the time weren't much better. Uh, they could produce a lot of glare, giving away your position or affecting your sight uh, of the target. And one of the biggest problems with these, however, was that you actually couldn't see the target and the reticle at the same time. You couldn't keep them in focus. In a normal rifle scope, the image of the target and the image of the reticle are projected onto the ocular lens at the same time, so they're both in focus. But here, the light has to pass through the objective and the reticle at the same time, and so they will not be in focus at the same time. And there were big problems with these four-minute arc dots here, because these were developed for competitive shooting, but at ranges of over 100 yards, that dot tended to cover a human head and make aiming very difficult. And on the BSA site, that stacked pattern of three dots, again, while very handy for target shooting, made it difficult for shooters in the field to reacquire their sight picture. They kept forgetting which of the dots they were actually using to aim. Now, what you're probably wondering here is like, okay, well, what is it actually like to shoot one of these? So, well, let's find out. I'm actually gonna take this out to the range here and try shooting a couple shots with the iron sights and with the Ulster sight and see how they compare. All right, so I'm going to be using a shooting bench, not very authentic, but I want to give this the best chance possible. I've got three targets set up. I'm going to shoot five rounds at one just to get my eye in with the iron sights. I'm going to do another five rounds at the next one with iron sights, and I'll do the last five with the Ulster sights. And these aren't sighted in at all, so it's just going to go by grouping. Hopefully it falls somewhere on the target, and we'll get to see how good a grouping I can get. Not the most scientific test, but we'll see how it goes. So we'll see how that went, but uh, one thing I can say is, yeah, it is very slow to acquire your target with this thing. It's got a very narrow field of view, but once you are on your target, it does make a difference. You can see it very, very clearly. So in regular combat, probably not the best idea, but if you're a sniper, eh, it kind of works. So another problem with this is that the vibration really knocks this around. So you can see that the rear cover plate with the apertures has been knocked loose. Also, this tends to get knocked back into one of its two folded positions. So this could fold back. You'd also fold forward, but you also needed to inlet the stock to allow that to happen. So this required quite a bit of modification to the stock to work, unlike a lot of the other sites. All right, so let's have a look at the targets. Here's the practice target. So the group, oh, rather big, not too bad, but down and to the left. Here we have the more sighted in target. Also, same sort of grouping, down and to the left. And finally here we have, with the Ulster sight, quite a tight little group here. It's actually very easy to see the point of aim, even though it took forever to actually acquire the target. So again, not bad at all. I can see a sniper with enough training making good use of this. So just a few other things to note with this sight. The objective lens is sandwiched between two metal plates, and we worry that this might cause the lens to crack under the shock of firing. So we decided to pad it by making a gasket out of wax thread. Also, to get a tight fit of the sight onto the nose cap, it's necessary to use shims made out of lead foil. 
Also, this particular site has some interesting provenance. It once belonged to one Herbert Irving Stevenson, who was born in 1878 and served in the Royal Canadian Dragoons during the Second Boer War and in the Fort Garry Horse during the First World War, where he was awarded the Distinguished Service Order with two bars. He also served as the Provincial Director of Natural Resources for Manitoba from 1930 until 1942 when he retired, and he died the following year in 1943. So now the question is, how did these actually perform in combat? combat. Well, the thing is, we don't actually know. There's not a lot of documentation of these things being used, nor are there really many photographs of soldiers using them. But all we know is that by 1917, the British optics industry had finally caught up with demand, and these were starting to be phased out. Although they weren't declared surplus to requirements until 1922, well after the war had ended. But anyways, the British did end up creating a quite successful sniper program. And indeed, they introduced a doctrine that gave them an edge over the Germans, which was to use a two-man team of spotter and sniper, which is a system still used today. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much to Gord Crosley of the Fort Garry Horse Museum for allowing me to borrow these sites and try them out at the range. I'll see you next time on another episode where we'll look at yet more fascinating military and civilian hardware. Until then, I'm Jean Messier. Have a great day.